I personally think that right now is a great time. If you have extra money to put into it, discretionary income. I, I've been in this too long. It's going to go back up. I, I remember when Hulk 18198s went down to $8,000. And now what is a uh, Hulk 181 and 98 sold for what, 153000 last year? Something crazy like that. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Swagglecast, a video podcast series where I get to have elevated conversations with influential people in the comic book hobby. My guest today is Vincent Zerzolo. He is one of the most notable comic book vintage dealers there is in all of the collectible space. He is the co-founder of Metropolis Comics and Comic Connect, one of the largest collectible auction houses in the entire world. I thought we had a great conversation talking about the state of the collectible market, the auction house format, and we even got to dive into some of his own personal collection and talk about a venture he has for a comic book that he himself is working on. I hope you guys enjoy our conversation, you know, maybe grab some bags and boards and put us on in the background. And with that, I give you Vincent Zerzolo. All right, well, I'm with Vincent Zerzolo from Metropolis Comics. Vincent, it's good to see you again. Thanks so much for hopping on the channel today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm always excited to talk about comic books and collectibles. This should be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I, we've been able to meet at a couple shows. I, I've, you know, uh, taking your time, you know, in the hustle and bustle of, of the cons and, and, you know, had you uh, record with me, and which I really, really appreciate. And I think people are always very excited to, to hear from you because you've been in comics for so many years. Like you've been doing this for so long. You just completed another Comic Connect, big Comic Connect auction. Actually, uh, probably at the time when people start to see this, it would have completed a week and a half ago or so. Um, last week. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, last week. But it's really funny, you know, you, you come through, you have so many huge books, so many huge keys. You've been doing it for so long. I just have to start and ask, does anything excite you anymore? Do you, do you still get excited holding AF-15s in your hand? What, what, what's your feeling on those? Yeah, so, so there are times when I'm working where we're moving so fast that I don't have a moment to stop and smell the roses, so to speak. Yeah. But that there there also are times where i i have that moment where I, I get a new consignment in and it's a box of golden age or or a run of every you know sorry a group of every silver age marvel key or a group of you know, right. silver age dc keys and you know an action one or superman one and there are those, these moments where i just look at it and go how cool is this i mean that i get to do this every day i get to deal with um Comic books, which are one of my favorite things in the world. I have I have several passions in my life. Um, comic books are at the top of that list. Uh, I love food as well. Uh, anybody who follows me on social media sees that um, I'm a big foodie and love to cook and love to eat. Um, and uh, so when you put those two things uh, together and, and you have those things as a passion, uh, for me, every time when I am getting a great consignment. I'm super excited. Uh, every time I'm sitting to have a great meal, I'm super excited. But going to the comic book end of it, um, there are even times when I'll get a collection in and it's just like a low to mid grade run of 50 boxes of silver to bronze. And I'll look at it and I'll go, wow, when I was a kid, I would have killed to be able to sit down and read these. And I've read a lot of them already, but just the idea that I have them all in one place, right. doesn't matter the condition, just looking at these great covers, knowing the great stories that are inside of them, it, that doesn't get old for me. It doesn't get tiring for me. I really, really do love what I do. I'm extremely passionate about what I do. And it's not just the comic books and collectibles, but it's also the relationships and the people that I've gotten to know over the last, so over 37 years for me dealing in comic books. Um, you know, early on it was part-time while I was in school, but since 93, I've been doing this full time. Um, and so I have friends and I have clients who I, I run into at shows that knew me when I was selling comic books out of my basement apartment in Rockaway Beach when I started out when I was a teenager. And, and so and to hear these these uh, people say, hey, I'm I'm happy to see how well you've done, which thank you very much. That's great. But also to hear them. I remember when you were a kid and da 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 da. And, and I, I go, wow, this is it's so cool to have those types of experiences. Also, I, one of the one of my favorite things 
Uh, I once had a, a client come and buy an AF-15 for himself. And then five years later, you know, he had gotten married. I hadn't heard from him in a long time. He had a kid and he had saved up his money to buy his kid an AF-15. So it's like, like those types of things, generational type of things where you're dealing with uh, 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 two generations of, of collectors. Those are really special moments for me. So the answer is I, I don't get tired of the comic books. Um, the only thing that can get tiring sometimes is running a company because when it comes down to it, that has very little to do with comic books on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes it gets a bit exhausting. I love to talk about comic books. I love to come out on shows, podcasts, uh, TV shows. I was just on the most expensivest with this rapper named Two Chains, who's like right. in his fifth season with the show. And it was so much fun. I love doing stuff like that. Anytime for me, I see to, to explain to you like this, when I was in college and I'd be at a party and I'd meet a girl, uh, a girl would say, sooner or later, and especially in New York, they'd ask you, so what do you do for a living? And I'd say, oh, I sell comic books. And if they didn't walk away, they go, no, really, w w what do you do with it? And I'm serious, they, some of them did walk away. And they would go, no, seriously, what do you do for a living? And I would say, no, I I'm serious, I, I sell comic books. I, I buy and sell, I have a mail order company, uh, an e-commerce company, well, now it's e-commerce, but back then it was mail order. And, and you know, uh, it, it didn't go well all the time, let's <laughs> put it that way. But nowadays, when I'm at a party and I mentioned I'm in the comic book business, there's like a swarm of people come by and they all wanna to talk to me and they all wanna talk about their favorite comic books, their favorite comic book TV shows, movies, uh, video games, whatever it is, the, the nerds are now the cool kids and it's really fun to see that change. And for me, being able to promote comic books and collectibles on, on, on a show like yours or on a television show, uh, documentaries, whatever it may be, is a way for me to elevate the art form and elevate the collectability and the uh, investment um, um, uh, possibilities with, with comic books and collectibles. So I'm always enjoying this and having fun with it. And anytime I have a chance to, to get people who are on the outside to understand what we love and why we love it and to respect it and appreciate it and maybe even consider it as something as part of their portfolio or maybe they just wanna read stuff for enjoyment's sake, that makes me really happy. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's funny it, it, as you talk about it, like it, you remind me of the, the the platitude that is like the, uh, if you just do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I, and it's like, I totally disagree with that. You can I, still do what you love and it's still work. I, I, I will tell you this and you can ask a lot of my customers and friends. I work my ass off and yeah. I do it because I love what I'm doing, but it's the work ethic that I was brought up with. I, I'm the son of uh, immigrants from Italy. Uh, my parents came here with nothing. They lived the American dream, put three sons through college. Uh, my father didn't barely spoke English when he came over here. And uh, to this day, he still has 96 years old and still has a broken English accent. And uh, he bought real estate. You know, he, he started off as a, a dishwasher and moved his way up to pizza man and then to chef and restaurateur and uh, bought real estate and, 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 and made a life for our family and my mother was a consummate homemaker and host hostess um, and I was raised with this work ethic that you know you 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 want something out of life you have to work for it uh, knowledge is power so I was always studying in school and be the best you can be and these are these are lessons that my parents instilled in me and my mother especially I remember telling me anything you want to be in life as long as you work hard at it you can accomplish it and so I had set goals out for myself and I wanted to um, pursue those goals and make those goals into a reality. I wrote many of them down and uh, turned them into reality. One of my first goals out of college was I wanted to be the biggest comic book dealer in the country, in the world. And uh, within six years, I merged companies with Steve Fischler and Metropolis and we are bar none the biggest comic book dealers in the world when it comes to vintage comic books. I mean, I can't speak for modern stuff. It's not our specialty. Uh, there are probably warehouses out there with millions of modern books, um, but we probably have, you know, 20 books worth more than their inventory. So right. um, vintage is where it's at for us. And, and we do deal in modern stuff. I don't want you to think we don't. It's just I wouldn't say 
we have a million copies of books from the last 10, 15 years. Right. Um, we definitely have a good selection. We even had it. Um, we've, we've had some great fortune with uh, Ultimate Fallout number four, a signature series nine eight Stanley signed that I sold. Do you remember what it sold for? I think it sold for it was something a, crazy. It was 40, around forty three thousand. So I think 40. it was uh, it was just about tied for the record. Just yeah, right there. I mean, it's that's great for for modern books, and, the, and you know this new Spider Verse movie came out, and I, I haven't seen it yet, but everybody's told me it's amazing. I can't wait to see it. No yeah. pun intended, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you. This. I mean, you you definitely, in my opinion, I mean, you, clearly, you guys have become the biggest. You know, at, at least uh, like you, you mentioned it, Metropolis has become one of the biggest comic dealing companies that there is, and then you have this. Uh, what you described, like that's the parent company to Comic Connect. You just had your big auction. Definitely yeah. a lot of big highlights that came out of Comic Connect. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe I can talk about them a little bit while they're on the sure. screen. But you know, talking about that idea of like, oh, just not seeing or, or or being desensitized to you know having all these books in your hands. There were some cool ones in there: a nine nine Iron Man one and a nine nine wow. New Mutants ninety eight. Yeah. Like, I guess my question to you with some of those ones, like. Are there from time to time things that still surprise you as you get them in hand? And, and are there any like uh, particular stories or books that you can think about that that even in, maybe in this last auction that you're just like, oh, this is something well, different? Yeah, there, you know, there's always something in each auction that kind of goes, wow, how did that guy find that? Or how did he get that? Or um, where did that come from? Anytime you see something like a 9-9, it's always kind of you know really special moment. You're looking at it and going, "Wow, this really is that special. It's so pretty." Uh, so those are the types of things that really can get you excited. I'm trying to think from this auction. Um, there were a lot of the bigger books um, were uh, varied in condition. Um, I'm trying to think of some of my favorites from this auction. They weren't necessarily always the most valuable, but I will, I will say like the Suspense Comics 11. That was a really magnificent book, and it sold last year during the height of the pandemic for $135,000. And the, I can tell you that the consigner was, you know, um, excited to auction it, but had some trepidations about what would it realize. And uh, I remember when it broke 100,000 and I was like, okay, we're on the right track. And when it hit like the 135 mark, I was like, all right, we're, we're tied. I think it was 135, 137. Okay, we're right there. And I think it ended up selling for $147,000. That was really special. Special um, because we broke a record on that book. It's the highest graded one of one prom, um, uh, suspense comics number 1198. Then the other thing I love about it is it's a co cover by L.B. Cole. And L.B. Cole is one of my favorite Golden Age cover artists. It's just something so unique about everything he touched. He had a very um, uh, unique uh, sense of color. Uh, palette and and anytime you see his covers you know they're his by how the colors are set up and how they contrast from one another um and then he, he was a brilliant artist as well but i, I had heard rumors and i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure if they're true that he used to mix his own colors to come up with those very unique mm. color palettes that he utilized in his comic books and to me i think that's uh it was that was really special for me um and there, there were so many great books every night had something different um and and we're dealing with a marketplace that is in flux there's a yeah. lot of different things going on depending on the time period i still think golden age is incredibly strong there's a lot of fluctuations in the silver to modern market um but overall it was a strong auction and it shows that there's still a ton of people out there who are passionate who are not afraid to put their money where their mouth is and they uh you could see by the results that that was a true statement yeah you know that that's something that's super interesting you know, just getting at the idea of the 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 seller who was a little bit nervous putting that their book out, and I wonder, like, as someone who you know, you're kind of the face of this of these auctions and things like that, and and people kind of trust you to, mm -hmm. hey, hey, I'm going to give you my books, like, you know, hopefully, you know, you can get the best price, get the best deal. Do you feel like pressure each time going into yeah. an auction? Like, like, yeah. what is that? Because I, I would imagine that, like, you know, there's. I mean, we can dig into like how the consigning part actually works, but I just imagine that there, sure. there's always a little bit of butterflies that comes with each. Set, uh, right? It's it's much worse than butterflies. You mm -hmm. have to understand that I have personal relationships with a lot of these people, and the people that I don't have incredibly you know longstanding relationships, they're entrusting us to get them the best 
price we possibly can for their collectibles. And um, we're, we work our tails off. We have a very intense um, marketing plan that is detailed and gr very granular. Um, I, I do a lot of the promotional videos that we uh, use to promote different um, items and lots in the auction. Uh, I do uh, embedded listing uh, videos for, for uh, high profile pieces and even sometimes, you know, smaller pieces that are just light. Um, I probably shoot about, on average, about 70 videos just for pre-auction and then throughout the course of the auction a lot more and if we see something that needs a little extra help we might put more videos up or, or, or do some extra promotion uh, uh, in social media wise or direct marketing wise and so we have a variety of different techniques that we use to try to get as many people as, ex as excited as humanly possible to bid in the auctions but I'm gonna lie if, if I were to say to you that we all it's always we come up smelling rose like roses it's not true it's impossible as an auctioneer to 100% of the time satisfy 100% of your consigners. Now, um, I can tell you that I my my dream for this is that nobody walks away a loser. Everybody wins. The customer wins by getting a great product that they want. We win by making our commission. The seller wins by getting an extraordinary price for their collectible. Um, and when it doesn't work out like that, you feel sick to your stomach. Uh, and, and that is one of the toughest things about being an auctioneer. Uh, and you, you know, at certain points you have to, you have to give yourself a little bit of a break and say, Hey, I did the best I possibly could. We have the, we have great clients. If they're not feeling this piece is a certain point you have to kind of understand that you don't have control over everything. And, and those times are very, um, stressful for me, uh, before an auction, especially, but you know, after an auction, if, if something doesn't go as well, um, but you also have the counterbalance of having so many great successes. Our company is known for breaking records and doing incredibly well. So more times than not, our consigners are very happy about the results. Um, and, and I feel very confident in saying that uh, pound for pound, I believe our auction, our auction format and our team is the strongest, most passionate um, and well versed in the uh, broad spectrum of auctioneers who deal in comic books and other collectibles. Uh, we deal in comic books, original comic art, pulps, VHS, video games, memorabilia, from time to time st statues. We are very strong in toys when we get them. Uh, and we've done movie props, which we've done incredibly well with. Our, our clientele went crazy a couple of years ago for uh, Wonder Woman's lasso. Whole, uh, Thor's hammer, and we had a whole host of other types of movie props, and did really well. Um, that stuff is uh, doesn't come around every day, so yeah. but we do our best to get it, uh, and, and we're already excited about our next auction that's coming up. We just got an amazing consignment from um, a company called Flip Mode Comics, and they uh, big fans are you know them, yeah, big fans, yeah, of them. great guys, and. Uh, they, they chose our company. I think uh, we had a lot to offer them that they found appealing. And we've gotten the first batches of books graded, and it's just, it's it's super exciting. I'm so excited for these guys. This is a, quite an exciting find, close to 4,000 huge comic books. Yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 great. And there's a, there's a, a PEP 22, a sensation uh, number one. There's a, a slew of Captain America's. There's 1950s horror books. It, the, the list goes on and on. And I just think just found a, Journey into Mystery number one double cover. That's amazing. Right. Uh, and I think a, I think there's an Archie one coming out of the collection. So there's so many cool books, and it's going to be very exciting to bring them to market. Uh, I couldn't be happier for them. Really nice people, and we're going to be promoting them. Maybe we'll come on before the uh, auction gets kicked off, and we'll we'll promote sure. some of the cool pieces. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's so many exciting things. Um, yeah. But yes, you're right. It's it's not all always great. And it sucks when it isn't. And I'll be the first to admit, uh, I don't like letting people down. I, I definitely take my responsibility very seriously as an auctioneer. And I want to make sure that people are happy. Um, we do put our best foot forward. You can't always hit a home run. Uh, we're hoping at least to get a single or a double. Um, and uh, we, we are, I can promise you this, nobody's working harder for their consigners than we are. Right. And I, I would imagine it's like you said, it's like every every sale is different, every book is different, 
every single, you know, when you sell, who's looking, you know, that, that's the one thing I always say on my channel is like any given sale, right? You know, it just, you, you never really know, but I imagine a lot of what you do is just kind of managing the expectations of what, you know, could be out there in the market. And I also think that it's probably a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes I, I imagine if there's very rare golden age books that haven't come up for sale for a long time, I mean, like you, there's nothing to no, right. There's nothing to base off of like, Oh, what, what should this finish at? It hasn't sold in seven years. Who knows? I'm sure it's going to be a lot higher, but at the same time, yeah. we still don't know. Right. So yeah, there's a, there's sometimes there's um, educated guesswork done, right. but you have to understand that between Steve and myself, we have gosh, uh, over 80 years of experience in the comic book business. Mm -hmm. And we can usually come up with a decent guesstimate. Um, I sometimes, uh, you know, if I'm, I'm if I make an estimate, I I'm, I've made estimates on many auctions, and I've been spot on many times. And sometimes I'm completely off because there's a wild cards, so and you don't know somebody came out of nowhere and starts bidding crazy because they had crypto money or something. Who knows? But right. um, but yeah, the, the, we also have a database that is over 30 years old, so it has a lot of great information in it. And you watch trends, you analyze the market, you use comp. Comparative, uh, comparative uh, data that's out there and try to extrapolate some type of estimate uh, right. that is uh, more than just a, a guess. It's an educated uh, guess or based on solid data. So we try to do the best we can with that. Right. Let me transition a little bit to the other end of it. You know, you, you mentioned a little bit like the, uh, the clients tell that you guys have and the buyers. You know, I, I think when you're outside of comic books, even if people come over and I just tell them, well, yeah, this, you know, it's a thousand dollars or $2,000 or whatever, you know, the, the people, there's a lot of people there's like, who, who are these people that spend yeah. this much money on paper? Uh, you don't have to, you know, say who your clients are, but I'm just curious, like, who are these people over the years? Who, are, who are these people? Who are these people? Who are these people? Who are these people? I want to know. Um, so we have a large swath of collectors. Um, I, it's kind of interesting like on my phone at any, any any given day i can call up about a half dozen or so billionaires in the world that collect comic books uh, yeah. and guys who are tech giants who collect comic books um celebrities uh heads of fortune 500 companies but it trickles all the way down to blue collar workers um you name it I, we sell to everybody and you'll be surprised that a lot of the blue collar guys, they've, they're have very savvy guys who have saved their money and, and have, have been able to parlay it and invest in six figure books. And, and so it's not just these uh, white collar or, or very um, uh, high net worth people who are buying expensive comic books or even, you know, not so expensive comic books. It, it runs the gamut. And um, one of the things I was taught early on in my career was never judge a book by its cover. When I used to do conventions, uh, my, my buddy, who was my partner at the time, would say to me, hey, look, just because somebody comes in in a bummy T-shirt and sweatpants doesn't mean they don't have money. This right. is their time to relax on the weekend. So right. do they want to get dressed in a suit to come to a comic convention? Of course not. So they're going to come to the convention to be comfortable. And I always held on to that, and I never judge anybody by how they dressed, how they look, how they talk, how anything. Um, or uh, how much you're spending initially. I, I'll give you for instance, mm -hmm. I had a guy who spent, I think it was a little over $7,000 on his first order with me, which is a respectable order. And then six months later, bought a comic book for over $700,000. I could never have guessed that in a million years, but he was treated with the same level of courtesy and respect uh, and good customer service that we offer to anybody. Um, we, we really, I built my business um, when I was first starting out after college. I was competing against a, a whole bunch of guys who had way more money, knowledge, networks, bigger clientele base, you name it. They had me beat hands down. How could I compete with these guys? I saw that there was one thing grossly lacking in the comic book world at the time. This is the early 90s when I got out of uh, St. John's University where I went to school. Um, it was customer service. And what I did is I modeled my company after what I saw my father do at his restaurants and my mother do in our home, which is be being 
very welcoming and gracious and, and uh, putting the customer first. Um, and I was able to build my business based on this. Uh, I also worked my tail off to get as many collections as I possibly could and, and travel around to as many shows. And there were a lot of lean times back then where I'd go to a convention, travel to WonderCon and back when it was in Oakland, California, mm -hmm. and I would barely break even on the table, let alone make any money. And I was selling comic books at cost just to get cash flow up so that I could continue on with my business. And there were times that early on, I, I remember like, I was sitting there questioning myself, like, well, what am I doing? And, mm -hmm. and, but I also had a lot of good times where I was able to um, buy great collections and sell them and, and, and build a business and uh, make a living and more than make a living, start to design a life, design a lifestyle uh, from comic books. And that's something I believe is really important in anything that you do. Don't just make a living. It doesn't matter how much you make. Take, look at the money you're making from your work as something that enables you to enjoy your life in whatever ways that you want to enjoy your life, whether it is buying comic books, traveling, eating great food, um, donating it to charity, whatever it is, whatever passions that you have, uh, it's an ends to a means, not just an ends in and of itself. And those are things I, I think are really important. Yeah, it's good. Definitely a good mindset to have for sure. And good food for that. Now, tell me a little bit about uh, we were talking a little bit about flip mode and how sort of the consignment stuff works. This is just something that yeah. I'm curious that I think it actually is interesting for a lot of people. I think a lot of people, uh, at least in my sphere, you know, when I talk to people who still spend tons of money on comic books and all that stuff, spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, they still shy away from the auction space because maybe they feel like it's a little bit intimidated. Well, from like a uh, consignment and a buying to, to, to give you like, basically I got on the phone with these guys was like, listen, I'm the best. You should be consigning me. They're like, yeah, you're right. I'm going to give it up. We, we talked for uh, quite a long time. They were considering several, several alternatives to my company. <clears throat> but I think when they, when they allowed me to pitch them, talk to them about why I felt our company was the best choice and what we had to offer. I do truly believe this. You want someone who is as passionate about getting your business mm. to be the one representing your collection in the marketplace. In other words, so I, I, I threw everything in the kitchen sink to explain to these guys why we were the right choice for them. And I, and, and, and I believe this wholeheartedly. I'm doing the same thing once I get their consignments. I'm not just sitting there and resting on my laurels or just putting them up on my website, hoping somebody will see them. We bust our butts and have a great marketing plan, marketing, promotional, advertising plan put in place for each auction to get into uh, the onto the computer screens or into the homes of as many collectors around the world as we possibly can to get them excited about books in the auction. Um, once I think they, they felt that and they conferred with one another, they chose to go with my company. In terms to commit, uh, in terms of commission rates, we have a lot of flexibility because we uh, allow people. We, we call our auctions like a hybrid auction, where we have a um, a buyer's premium now that is an option for people. They don't have to go with the buyer's premium. Right. But what it is, we we for years straight straight away from doing a buyer's premium, we only had a ten percent seller's commission. But now we give people a choice on on CGC graded material and CBCS and PGX graded material, um, where they can go the buyer's commission or the seller's uh, commission. Uh, buyer's premium or seller's commission, and we give them a choice. And people make different choices based on different um, theories they have on, on on how people bid in auctions. And uh, I think the flexibility that we allow um, uh, gives people a tremendous amount of uh, um, choice and and freedom, and it makes it even easier for them to say yes to Comic Connect. Right. Um, and basically the way it works is we put in a consignment agreement together, uh, we sign it, um, comic books or collectibles, VHS, video games, pulps, art, whatever it is, memorabilia, whatever you got to sell, well, we can sell it. Uh, they, they ship it into us or we pick it up from them. And we travel around the country and even around the world. I've been to uh, on business Europe, Asia, Australia, um, I'd say um, the only continents that I haven't been to for business are probably Africa and uh, Antarctica. Um, you know, uh, so it's, uh, and then we do business in Africa and I have a couple of penguins that 
that yeah, are huge Antarctica are, market, untapped. In, I think in Antarctica, we have a couple of penguins that buy Iceman yeah. comics. I don't know why, but yeah. Uh, so, but you know, th those are the types of things we're we're willing to go the extra mile, and that's really important. Um, and that's what you want in the person you're doing business with. Um, when somebody comes up with a great idea, hey, I didn't think of that. A customer says to me, what if we did this? I go, oh, shoot, that's a great idea. Let's utilize that. Let's let's try that. And so we've done things like that haven't been always part of our um, uh, regular uh, plan, but that have actually been rather effective and, and have been valuable. And then we start to incorporate those things into our regular plans. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how it works. Yeah. So, so they might be a little bit different because obviously those guys have been selling and they're kind of they're more versed in this. Like, yeah. would there be a situation where, let's say, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about comic books, and then my grandma like had like a you know amazing golden age stuff, and it's like obviously it's a, it's a pretty huge and let's say it was it was really great stuff. It's a pretty huge upfront cost to like mm -hmm. get it graded. Like, how do you yeah. guys navigate this? Like, I'm sure do you guys so, do like these sort of white glove service type of thing like into this? Cool. I mean, it's yeah. an interesting let, let me let me let me tell you all the different uh, ideas some people just bring us their graded material already and mm -hmm. when we when they do that we offer for free we will do reviews on all their comic books uh, that, to see if there was anything that can get upgraded and then we will send those into cgc or wherever um then then there are people who inherited the collection don't know anything about it and one of the things we do is we will um we, we have in-house pressing and uh we will we will lay out the fees for both the pressing and the grading, which takes a, a tremendous amount of um, expense off the shoulders of the consigner because who wants to be bothered with that? But this is what we do every day, so we're, we don't mind. And, and it's an, an added benefit to our consigner. Hey, you don't have to write a check out for $25,000 or $50,000 to grade your comic books. We'll take care of that. It's, it's rolled into the uh, expenses. It comes off the top at the end of the auction. Right. And basically, that's something we do. Same thing for pressing and cleaning. We do dry cleaning. We do pressing here. We have a great team that works on it. Um, if there's a piece that we don't think we have the technical expertise to uh, to, to handle, we will recommend uh, an outside uh, company um, to handle that. So that's not uh, something um, that's a problem. There's always a solution. And um, we try to keep our customers' expenses down. One of the uh, number one edicts that we give to our employees is <clears throat> treat these comic books as if we own them ourselves. Do not waste our clients' money. Um, let's make sure we're, we're maximizing everywhere we possibly can on, on their books. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Now, just going a little bit in the weeds of the auction, just because I'm curious, uh, you, you answered a little bit of the, uh, I was going to ask you about what, what sometimes on, on Comic Connect, I see that there's a buyer's premium and then sometimes I don't. So yeah. that's, that's a seller option. Yeah. I did want to ask you about the, the style that you guys have, which is like the three minute timer reset. Okay. You know, obviously uh, most people will be familiar with eBay, right? Where eBay mm -hmm. you, timer runs down and just everyone yeah. jams their bid right at the last second and whoever yeah. got the highest wins. You guys yeah. have a system where when you do a bid, timer resets three minutes. Yeah. So there isn't a uh, sniping, as I call right. it. Uh, so tell me the philosophy behind okay. that. So um, I personally believe that the weakest way to sell is a fixed ending time like eBay has. Mm -hmm. And the reason I believe that that's uh, the, the worst of the methods is because there have been so many times where I've bid on eBay and the clock winds down, I put in my last bid, and it sells for a few hundred dollars more. And I go, oh my God, if I had just had 10 more seconds, I would have definitely gone higher. It's now, somebody, somebody somebody, who runs that type of auction, people at eBay, so, well, that in, entices somebody to put in their highest bid. But p even when you put in your highest bid, sometimes what you think is your highest bid, if you had had another chance because you know you're losing it and you were so sure you were going to win it, right. you would have put another bid in. Right. So right. to me, that's the worst. Now, the second worst, in my opinion, is a live auctioneer. And the reason I say that is because you could end up getting the short end of the stick there. And here's what I mean by that. I can't tell you how many times I've been bidding in a live auction and the auctioneer either has plenty of time and just drags out an auction, which is good for the seller, or they go really fast because they get through a hundred more lots and they don't have a lot of time 
because there was, I don't know, a glitch in their system or just because they that's how slow their auctions run. Mm -hmm. And what you'd never know as a bidder as is, okay, the auctioneer goes, going once, going twice, going three times, and then pauses, sold. Or does he say, going once, going twice, going three times, sold. And you don't know that. And that, that's, that's, that's a small uh, sample of how it can be uh, dragged out or, or cut. Uh, and with our system, you have an absolute knowledge that you have three minutes. And anytime somebody puts in a bid with three minutes or less, it rewinds the clock and you get an extended bidding for another three minutes. Now, some people say maybe three minutes is too long. We're looking into that. Maybe we'll come up with another concept. We'll see. We're doing a, a modernization and replatforming, uh, which hopefully will be done in the next, who knows, three months or so, maybe six months. And uh, it'll be exciting to see. I think people will be really excited to see how we uh, revolutionize um, the bidding process in the future. We have a lot of really great ideas that we're working with. So those, those are my answers as to why I feel our auction model is the best. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it definitely, uh, all the examples that you've talked about, I've experienced it from a, a buying standpoint, for sure. Um, so switching your gears a little bit, and you know, you, we, we, the circle of trust, we could be here. I'm sure you are great friends with the good folks over at CGC and great friends with the good folks over at CBCS. But I did want to ask you a little bit about the value difference that sometimes is shown between the sales of CGC and CBCS. You know, there, there's been times, I think even in Common Connect auctions where I've seen a Hulk one and in one grade on one company, a Hulk one on another grade on another company, they sell and, and there's a price difference there. Does this, like, is this something that you think about where it's like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, there's just knowing what I know about the interest of the clients and people who buy, they just have a preference towards one company or does it kind of blow your mind? Cause you're, you're like it's the same book. No, it, it doesn't, it doesn't blow my mind. There's a certain level of confidence that people have. Uh, with, with let's say CGC because of their longstanding uh, tenure in the business, um, the expertise there. Um, so on certain price points, the CGC books may sell for higher. Um, and then you have other situations on lower price points where they can sell for the same. Um, and even sometimes where you, I, I've had auctions where I've had a PGX and a CGC and a CBCS and You'd be surprised. Sometimes it's not the obvious choice. Sometimes it's CBCS and sometimes it's a PGX that sells for more. Why exactly? I can't get into the mindset of every person out there bidding. But in in uh, in basically when you look at it, though, uh, the vast majority of comic books that have been graded are uh, third party graded are CGC graded comic books. They have a very long standing uh, tenure in the business. So they've been around the longest. They have a great team of people there. Um, we're, we're friends with the guys at CBCS. Um, Wes Steffen and his team, really nice bunch of people there. Um, and then uh, PGX is a, is a company on the West Coast and, uh, you know, good people there as well. Um, some companies have a better um, ability to spot restoration and than others. I, I would say that's definitely true. Um, but I think um, all three companies have an appeal to different types of submitters. Um, and, yeah, that's what I could say. Right, right. And now let me ask you a little bit about this, uh, which is the uh, the QES, the, st the sticker mm -hmm. thing, which is like a part of the company. Now, it, you know, I, I completely understand the 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 thought behind it, but I wanted to ask, like, you, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen like the memes where it's like people would be like, oh, CGC rolls out a, a grading of your graded slab comic book like you know your 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 comic is a 9 8 but your slab your yeah. slab is only a 9 2 you know so, and there's, there's some jokes with that uh, i understand what qes is which is like a a, a way to kind of talk about because there is difference in grades and i think a lot of people sure. would like that but, but give me give me your your All take right. on so first thing i want to share with you is exactly what you, you mentioned about the memes that are out there so years ago yeah i had so much so many people Oh my God, this blows my mind. You know, I, I saw your scan and the, and the holder has a scratch in it. And I'm saying this very sarcastically. Right, right. It really drives me insane. 
and they wouldn't buy the book because they're scratching the holder. And of course, we'll say, okay, we'll send it and get you a new holder. But if you're watching this and you don't buy a book because there's a scratch on a piece of plastic, you need to kind of take a step back for a second and realize that's not an obstacle for you to buy a book. If it is, what I don't know what to tell you, but I just don't quite get that. To me, you look at the comic book itself, and if there's a scratch or a crack or something, you just say to the people who are selling, hey, can you get this fixed for me? I'd like to buy this book. Okay, we'll get it fixed. We didn't notice that when we got scanned that there was a scratch on the, on the holder. By the way, there are also products out there that can be used to buff out those you know, slight imperfections, not a crack, but you know, uh, certain little light scratches or, 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 or marks. Um, so QES, let's talk a little bit about QES. Uh, so my, my, I guess my, my end uh, lesson to be learned, if there is one, don't let a holder uh, stop you from buying a book. We used to say years ago, we're going to start a company. All we do is grade holders. Yeah. And I, so I actually pitched this jokingly to a customer. He's like, really? Like he wanted it. And I went, no, I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. No. Yeah. So, so go moving on to QES. QESComics.com is a company that we started because we sometimes notice that um, in any grading company, CGC or anybody else, they're, sometimes we feel like they're fixated on the defects of a comic book rather than the positive attributes of a comic book. And sometimes you have books that are, let's just say, um, maybe it's not a 9.2 or a 9.4, but it's somewhere right in the middle of a 9.3, which doesn't exist. So you give it a QES sticker, and unlike the competition out there, what we do with QES is on the label of the comic book that you're buying, we'll say why we thought it was that impressive. Sharp right edge, um, great corners, uh, beautiful vibrant colors, uh, the uh, prime focus area of the book is exceptional. Uh, there's a bunch of different perfect staple placement, um, great... Uh, um, uh, no miswraps, that type of thing, you know, perfectly aligned comic book. Uh, so there's a variety of different factors that can go into it. it you know, you can see a VG, a 4.0, and then see another one and you go, oh my God, this one is so much nicer than that one. But I understand why they're both 4.0s, but that one's really nice, QES label. And so this is a, a service we offer out and it's nothing that anybody has to do or has to buy, uh, but it is something that we have been doing for a while now. And we notice that oftentimes books with QES labels on them will go for premiums above what the regular graded comic book would go for. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the exceptional eye appeal, um, you know, having a, having a Silver Age Marvel with absolutely no Marvel chipping and a beautiful uh, sharp as a razor right edge, uh, corners that are, are, you know, like these perfect perpendicular 90 degree angles and they're just sharp. So you have a lot of different attributes there. Um, sometimes, hey, if I get a book in raw and then I get it graded, and I remember this book had the most supple white pages, I'll add that to a QES. Uh, so there's a lot of different factors that go in there, and it's not very expensive. You can check out the uh, pricing at QESComics.com. Uh, that is an in-house service that we give to our, we, we sell to our customers here, and it is something that's done by our team, and um, we definitely take it very seriously. And we don't just give willy-nilly these labels because then it would have no value. However, having said that, there are a lot of really exceptional books that come through our doors. And if somebody wants the service, we offer it. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, let me switch gears a little bit, um, talking about just, just the overall comic market and things. And these are you know, the types of questions and thoughts that I've, I've gotten from you before when we've talked at shows and things like that. People love to hear you know, your your dealers thoughts on the market where we are state of things mm -hmm. um i spend a lot of time on my channel just kind of talking about that type of stuff you're someone who like you said you've been in it for many many years and obviously you have like a a belief in this i mean i don't think you'd be in this business if you weren't someone who is you know bullish on the industry as a whole but can you just talk a little bit about where we are in 2023 how does the macro environment affect comic sales what was your experience like, like in 2008? We're even outside of comic books and we had housing market crash and things like that. Do you have memories of that? Yeah, oh, very, very, very vivid. Very vivid. I'd love to hear you just talk about. So let me, let me talk about the uh, Great Recession that we had yeah. uh, in 2008. 
So um, it was a very scary time. It was a lot. There was also the dot com bubble that burst in, in the early two thousands. Um, 2001, I think it was, or 2002, somewhere around there. So you have these different periods where you have these economic issues, crises that are happening in the in the world, around the world. And the, let's take the, the Great Recession, for instance. What I noticed was there was a, a flat line for a small period of time, and then our business started growing and growing and growing. And what you saw that people were terrified of the of, of the stock market. They were terrified of real estate and they were making zero in the bank. So they had to think for themselves, how do I make money for myself here? Oh, I love comic books. Hmm, I'll start to invest more of my money in comic books. It's not doing me any good sitting in the bank and I believe in comic books. So at least I know that whatever I buy them for, I think they should be worth that. So, and they go forward. And so you have a lot of people that are buying, selling, investing and we saw our business grow and grow and grow and grow and I thought it plateaued at the, uh, the end last quarter qu quarter four of 2019 and I started feeling there was like a slowdown and then of course the pandemic hit and was one of the scariest times as a business owner and just as a human being um, you know having lived in New York City and going through having my business in Manhattan, going through 9-11 was one of these catastrophic moments that were terrifying. Um, COVID was also terrifying. I was one of the few companies in Manhattan that kept our business running. It was me and one employee. We had the ability to socially distance because we have a 5,000 square foot um, office. And so he worked in one end of the office. I went and worked in another end of the office. And everybody else worked from home, and we kept our business running during a lockdown. You have to understand, I would ride a bike. I didn't want to go in the subways. I would ride a bike from my house to the office. And the only people I saw in the streets were police officers, military, and drug addicts. And I'm not kidding. I saw people more than once shooting up heroin on the street in Manhattan. And this is also the times of riots and uh, protests and um, uh there were storefronts all over Manhattan that were boarded up. So it was a very, very scary uh, time. And I thought we're in a lot of trouble here. And what I uh, always believe in that I, I, I hold the keys to my own destiny. So I decided I was going to work my tail off during this period of time, harder than I had already before. Every time I think I can't work any harder, I work harder and smarter. Smarter is important too. And I was closing deals and putting deals together left and right and kept our auction business going, making some private sales, uh, sending out email blasts, whatever we could to, to, to excite people about comic books. And then we actually saw an uptick in April of 2020 uh, from April of 2019. I think our sales were up like 25% for that month, which was exceptional. Uh, and, and, that, and the pandemic pand uh, uh, mania did not... Uh, happened yet. It was starting to build towards that. And then May, June, July, it really started revving up and people were cooped up, locked up in their house, homes, and they didn't have anything to do. So they were looking through the collections. Hey, what do I need? What do I want to replace? And then everybody, because they were home, was posting everything on social media. And we have this wonderful thing of keeping up with the Joneses here in the United States where, hey, that guy has a nice X-Men number one. I want to get a better one. And so I saw this happening. And I saw even guys who were getting their checks from the government, their COVID checks, and buying comic books with them. So you, know, you had all these different things happening, and we saw this incredible infusion of um, money and, and passion and interest into collectibles during that two, two and a half year um, period. And also you had a lot of money, a lot of people who made money in crypto, pouring money into collectibles. Yeah. You had um, still no money to be made in keeping your money in the bank, so you needed to make it yourself putting that into collectibles. Uh, there were a lot of different reasons why um, things went bananas. And um, they started to come back down to reality over the last six to eight months. Anybody who's in the comic book business or collectibles business has seen that across the boards um, or most, I shouldn't say across the boards, I'd say for, mo for most periods of comic books, you, you've seen a decrease in value. Um, but one of the areas that I think in the grand scheme of things that has done particularly well 
is the golden age of comic books because I think of scarcity and scarcity and demand and also original art um, because it's one of a kind. Uh, although there are comps that you can say, well, that cover is worth this and that panel page is worth this, this should be worth that and so on and so forth. You can get a general idea, but the, the idea I'm trying to get across to you is that um, you can see by the results in our auctions, uh, the golden age part of the market is really strong. Um, uh, other parts of the market, market are in flux. And I personally think that right now is a great time if you have the um, extra money to put into it, discretionary income, so to speak, to put into collectibles because I think I, I've been in this too long. It's going to go back up. I, I remember when Hulk 18198s went down to $8,000. I remember I just sold one for 21000 and then it started, and I just bought one for eighteen thousand, and it started going down and down and down at eight thousand, and it was at eight thousand for a while, and then it started creeping up, 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 and now what is a uh, Hulk one eighty one and nine eight sold for what one hundred and fifty three thousand last year, something crazy like that. So when you see those types of things, uh, I, I'm not a prognosticator. I don't have a crystal ball. I, I do have, however, I do have a cosmic cube. Um, <laughs> this is actually from the first Captain America movie. I, I bought it. Oh, that's office. awesome. Love having it. Yes, it's my uh, Cosmic Cube. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, what was I saying? You know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do believe very strongly in the comic book market and the resiliency of it, and that uh, the cream will always rise to the top. So, if you're buying, it doesn't even have to be the highest graded of something, but if you're buying those great books, you'll see demand come back for those. And I do believe that good times are right around the corner. Uh, when I say right around the corner, it's going to take a little bit of time, but they're around the corner, I should say, uh, coming up soon. Uh, so you just, you know, I think you stick with it, watch the market, um, utilize the sold section of our website and other websites that are out there. Try to figure out where the market trends are headed. Also, most importantly, please buy what you like, buy what you love, because if the value goes down, at least you still have that great comic book. I've had some comic books that I bought during, uh, you know, two years ago that might not be worth as much now, but I look at them and I go, oh my God, these comic books make me so happy. I, you know, if it's not worth, it's worth a $2,000 less, oh, my life's not going to be over because I'm not planning on selling it right now and I'll sell it later, you know, or maybe I won't ever sell it. But the point being is, is, have confidence in this marketplace. It's a strong marketplace. It's filled with a very diverse number of buyers from all over the world who love American comic books and love actually foreign comic books, which is something else we've gotten into recently that are, we're gonna have a great selection of over, I think 150 foreign comic books in our next auction. So there's so much possibility out there. Um, and so many people who are, are passionate about comic books and collectibles that I think you should go into it realizing right now there are many, many buys uh, buy and hold type of items out there. And, and I'm happy to talk to anybody who is interested in talking about comic books and collectibles. You can call us up anytime, 1 800. Um, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on our 800 number. 877 uh, Metro is one of our 800 numbers. We'll put um, it in the description. The yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, or you can email us, and, and there's a hundred different ways. I'm also all over social media. You can also always contact me there. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about comic books and collectibles. Original art is something I love. I love toys. And I'll, I'll, if we if we're ready, I could give you a little tour of the the my. This is my personal office. If you'd like. Yeah, to see yeah, me. absolutely. Well, let me. You know, I've taken up a lot of your time, but uh, let me let me just while I got you, take one more one more little topic if you don't mind. One sure. one thing I want to ask you. Um, you know, you mentioned you guys were. Uh, you know, you do do some modern stuff, obviously like ultimate fallout four, like, you know, the Jurjevich one, like that's become a, a, a monster modern collectible and things like that. I am a little bit curious just to hear you talk about some of these markets like VHS and video games that are like pretty new and they're like kind of bubbling up and, you know, they're exciting. They're kind of unknown. Like what is your, I, I Maybe, maybe you don't have to talk, speak so specifically about them, but as someone who's been in this collectible space for a long time, what do you make of like emerging new collectible markets as they come and go? Or, or what are your thoughts on those? Or Okay. So let me, let me talk about yeah, that. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, when you're talking about categories like VHS and video games um, and, and things that are coming up soon, like, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, 
uh, records. They're going to start grading records. Um, they're also going to be starting grading the um, big discs that used to you could play movies on. Laser, laser disc. Yeah, you know, laser discs, stuff yeah. like that. Uh, I think you know everything is going to get certified sooner or later. And uh, right. I, I used to joke around about we're going to have we're going to sell celebrity lint. I want to get celebrity lint created. You know, this is uh, from. Yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio's belly button. Oh, I used to say really nice lint from yeah, one tap body. market, you know, some, yeah, some... I think there's a market there. Uh, so um, you had a tremendous amount of growth in uh, video games during the pandemic. And unfortunately, a lot of that uh, went down and tanked mm -hmm. um, even more so than other um, collectibles. Um, and sports cards also tanked really hard. Comic books, comparatively speaking to other collectibles, didn't tank as, as badly in terms of uh, I don't even like using the word tank. They, they didn't go down as much as other collectibles. Even the modern stuff didn't. I mean, when you see some, like, I've, I've heard of some cards that were selling for uh, $300,000 that are now selling for $20,000. I mean, like, right. yeah, that's it's bad. Like maddening. Yeah. So VHS, video games, tons, again, tons of really passionate people that are excited and interested in, in these uh, collectibles. And, and VHS has been something that's really been, um, something I've actually fallen in love with. I, I love video games because I love playing video games my whole life. I was on video games from Atari all the way through Nintendo and you name it and, and PlayStation. So, but but what's great about VHS is that you're talking about everybody has like a favorite movie or a bunch of favorite movies. So there's always something to click. I mean, I've bought VHS tapes that just, I didn't care they're great, I didn't care anything. I just like, oh my God, that's so cool to have that old VHS tape still sealed in the plastic in a cool little plastic holder, and I'm going to put it up and, and put it on uh, display. So that's really neat. Um, I do think there's a lot of room for growth with VHS and video games. I think things are, are, are moving in the right direction, and I think all these other categories um, are moving in the right direction. I also really would love to see, uh, I don't know if you could certify a matchbox, matchboxes. I, I like matchbooks, oh, matchboxes. Interesting. I find yeah. it fascinating. I think it's a. I, I was once at a San Diego Comic Con and a dealer came in. He didn't bring any comic books. He just had matchbooks. Oh, wow. Like, wow, matchbooks. That's because I, you know, who doesn't go to a restaurant if they have a cool matchbook you or matchbook box, matchbox? You don't take it home. Of course you do. You love yeah, yeah. it. really cool. And you shake it and it makes that noise. And you know, it's, and then you can use it at home. So, uh, and some of them are very artsy and beautiful design and great uh, fonts and and, 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 and colors. Uh, but having said that, uh, I do think there's a lot of legs for it. And I happen to love uh, all that stuff and, and really do believe in it. I especially am very impressed with how much VHS has grown. Um, a lot of great grading companies. IGS is really cool. Um, so that's really fun. Um, I can, I can, I'll show you something really cool. I'll share a quick yeah. little story. Um, do a little tour here. Yeah. So, so here we have Mike Tyson's punch out. Um, I was at a um, party uh, where Mike Tyson's was, was there. And I got to meet Mike Tyson, which was really cool. Uh, and my friend who, who introduced me to him, he said, hey, you know, this guy is like the king of comic books. So it's just that very nice of him to say. And that was, that was cool. I, or he, he said something like the Mike Tyson of comic books, which I didn't want to <laughs> piss off Mike Tyson. Yeah. And there. But Mike Tyson immediately said to me, oh, I love comic books. And I said, really? Well, you know, who's your favorite character? And he didn't even, he thought for a second, but he didn't like miss a beat at all. He just looked me dead in the eye and went, apocalypse. And I was like, oh my God, that is pretty crazy. Wow. So um, I, 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 before he left, I had one of my guys the day before cut out this spot for Mike Tyson to sign this video game. And so that we wouldn't damage it at all. So I handed it to him, I said, hey, Mike, would you mind signing this punch out? And he goes, sure, 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 no problem. And he starts to sign it, and somebody called his attention away, and he ended up signing it half on the box and half on the plastic. Oh, no. And I will never sell this because I have the greatest Mike Tyson story about this. But I, I remember watching him and signing it. I was like, no. <laughs> and, and now it's kind of cool and it's fun. Yeah. I'm a, I'll never sell this. This is just a really cool piece. Uh, I'll show you around a little bit more. Uh, I have other than comic books. Uh, I, I also collect original art, and you can see like there's Todd McFarlane uh, cover to Amazing Spider-Man 323. Right next to it is a Trad Moore um, uh, illustration of Spider-Man and Venom. Next to that is a Wolverine miniseries page by Frank Miller, and next to that is the um, right there 
is the Splash to Wolverine number one out of the miniseries. And then if you scroll up here, you'll see, um, gosh, you'll see over there, over, over that green statue is uh, Harry Houdini's handcuffs right there. Um, you have Sam Keith, John Byrne, um, Dennis Cowan and Bill Sienkiewicz on The Question, one of my favorite series. Uh, Mark Texiera on Wolverine, uh, Stephen Platt on on uh, Moon Knight with Spider-Man. And then here you have um, the first panel page with Electro by Steve Ditko and Amazing Spider-Man number nine and a couple of other. And then over here, a whole host of other really cool covers, including a um, Frank Frazetta Famous Funnies cover and the Weird Mysteries 4 cover by Bernard Bailey. Uh, even Matt Baker up there. Uh, so many great pieces. Joe King, one of my favorite artists. I love Night Router. And uh, you have over here the first Fairy Beast. That's one of my favorite pieces in my collection. Um, let's see, what else can I show you? Oh, is a bunch of just fun tchotchke type things that I like to collect and Mego action figures and statues. And there's a cover to one of the rarest variants in existence, the cover to uh, Spider-Man 667. And that is uh, by Gabriele Delotto. We also have Joe Bennett, uh, Sam Keith, Marshall Rogers. And right here is one of my favorite pieces. I'm a very big Bruce Lee fan. This is Bruce Lee's only signed movie contract from Golden Harvest. It's a three-picture deal signed in December of 1971, making $20,000 a picture, signed by Bruce Lee and by Raymond Chow, the head of Golden Harvest. And uh, as, a, as a person who studied uh, Jeet Kune Do, uh, Bruce Lee's martial arts, um, this is very near and dear to my heart. And I, I really love having that. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I I love everything I do, and I've got a pretty cool comic book collection too. Uh, I, I have one of the best jobs in the world in that. If you love comic books, I have you know hundreds of thousands of vintage comic books, and exactly. so any day I can go and look at a book, and you know every once in a while, you know you're grading stuff, you're putting stuff through the system. But every once in a while, you stop and you read a comic book, and you go. Wow, this is what it's all about, you know. These guys put down on on with pen and paper and in ink and and uh, and color and, and made these amazing comic books, and it's just it's so uh, really cool to be a part of that. The other thing I wanted to just share really quickly with everybody, uh, I've always dreamed of making my very own comic book, and this October at New York Comic Con, I will be premiering my comic book, The Addiction. I'm partners with David Quinn. And many might remember him from uh, Faust. Uh, him and Tim Vigil did a horror comic book called Faust. And he's also worked for all the other you know, major companies uh, and independents, uh, anything from uh, Ghost Rider, Doctor Strange to Lady Death and so, so on and so forth. And we've come up with a really great character, uh, Nikki Tino, The Addiction. And I think you guys are gonna really love it. Um, the artwork is done by an artist from Italy, from Rome. Her name is Claudia Valboni. She is fantastic. She's worked for everybody from Dynamite to Boom to Dark Horse and Image. Uh, so she's really fantastic. Uh, she just, I think, uh, won, um, won an Eisner or, or was nominated for Best Comedy Book for Killer Queens. Um, uh, David, obviously, just, you know, huge, huge, uh, great writer and, and a great collaborative uh, partner as well. And we have covers, variant covers being done by a uh, veritable who's who uh, of comic book artists. I'm not going to let out too much on that, but it's going to be really great. Um, I'm so excited about this. This is, again, like I said, a, a dream come true for me um, to be able to share some creativity beyond what I do in our auction business and our marketplace business and our dealership business um, and our art gallery to be able to bring a comic book to life. And uh, I hope you guys will enjoy it. And Get a chance to read it. It'll be digital as well as um, uh, in paper and in comic book stores and sold directly through us. That's amazing. That's incredible. Congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment and a, and, a, and a very cool new venture. I will tell you this. It's a lot harder to make a comic book than I ever thought it would be. Uh, it is a yeah. lot of hard work. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of hard work, but hopefully it will. Uh, it'll it'll be worth it. It'll be like creatively satisfying. You know, to it, have it's it. already worth it. it, it you know, I. I I'm, the way I will view the success of this comic book will not just be a number of sales or if it turns into a movie or a TV show or something, but I just want people to read it and tell me it, it made them happy or it made them laugh or it made them sad or some, something. If it evokes some type of emotional response uh, from them, I, I will consider that a success and I will be very happy 
uh, about that. But we will have a booth at New York Comic Con. I, I'm praying it'll be attached to the Metropolis Comic Connect booth so I can spend as much time as possible there. We'll have a great sales team there. We're going to have artists there signing their covers, signing interiors. Uh, we're flying in right now as it stands. We're flying Claudia in from Italy. She'll be there. And she is fantastic. And so we're really excited about it. Um, juggling a lot of stuff right now, but I, I wanted to make time to be on the show. I felt it could be really valuable for people who don't know about us to learn or who do know about us to learn more about us. And I, I hope it was uh, informative for you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was entertaining. And I thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, and uh, yeah, have fun with comic books. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Vincent, so much for for your time and and, and sharing with us, you know, your, your knowledge. Uh, just in case people want to, you know, find you, maybe they're instead of them waiting for New York Comic Con, uh, can you maybe drop them some social media handles or websites where they can check you out? Yeah, so MetropolisComics.com, ComicConnect.com, MetropolisGalleryNYC.com. Those are our websites. Um, you can find me under my name, Vincent Zerzolo, on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok. Uh, Twitter somewhere on Twitter, and we also uh, Metropolis headquarters M T R P L S H Q R uh, on Instagram, and um, you can find us everywhere. And it's not hard to uh, get in touch with us. We also have eight hundred numbers, and we're our websites have contact information. We're located in the heart of Manhattan, in the Midtown Manhattan, on thirty uh, seventh between fifth and sixth, and we travel around to all the conventions. We're going to be at Charlotte and San Diego Comic-Con. Those are the next two big shows we'll be at. We're excited to meet everybody out there. Very, very cool. Well, thank you so much, Vincent, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much for having me on the show.